joking with me this week. They said, what's, what's the deal with the, the stool? You want to be like a stand-up comedian or something? It's like, nah, just need something to hold my water. All good. So hey, let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12, where we're going to be looking at verses 46 through 50 together this morning. And over the past two months, we've been studying chapters 11 through 13 in the Gospel of Matthew, which focuses on people's different responses after having an encounter with Jesus. And Matthew's Gospel is written in such a way where we are confronted as readers time and again with the overwhelming evidence and eyewitness testimony that points to Jesus' authority and identity as the Messiah, Deliverer, and one true God of the universe. And so this morning, we're going to be finishing up Matthew chapter 12, which in many ways acts as a turning point in Matthew's gospel. And the reason why I say that is because in the first 11 chapters of his gospel, Matthew, he allows us to spend time with Jesus, where we learn of the miraculous circumstances surrounding his birth, we get to listen to his transformational teaching, and we have a front row seat to witness his endless miraculous works where people are rescued from disease and disasters, the demonic, and even death itself. And it all points us towards Jesus' identity and authority, that he is the promised Messiah, fulfilling all of the prophecies about that promised Messiah in the Old Testament. And so now that we come to chapter 12, the time has now come for us to make a decision, right? We, we, we've gotten to taste and see. We've gotten to spend time with Jesus. And now the time has come for us to answer the question, who do you say that Jesus is? And so from what we've witnessed, we can either choose to reject him as a liar and a lunatic, or surrender our lives to him as our Lord and Savior. However, there can be no in-between. Jesus makes that clear as he states right in the heart, right in the middle of Matthew chapter 12, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so this morning we will be studying the conclusion of Matthew chapter 12 together, where in verses 46 through 50, we read of how while speaking with his disciples, Jesus receives word that his mother and brothers are outside waiting to speak with him. And Jesus sees this as a prime teaching opportunity where he illustrates how the call of discipleship, to be his disciple, it requires us to love and follow after him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength above all else. And this includes our families. And so we're going to break down our passage together in three different parts. And they are priorities, mission, and faith. So first, family and priorities. In the first section of our study, we're going to see how prioritizing our relationship with God above all else is, is the key to having a vibrant and healthy family. Second, family and mission. We learn how God places mission at the center of our family. And then lastly, family and faith. We conclude our study by looking at the incomparable blessings of belonging to the family of faith. Now, before we read our passage aloud together, if you're reading from the ESV, which is the English Standard Version, it's the, the version of the translation of the Bible that we use, that we put on the screens, one of the, the many great English translations that, we ha that are available to us. But if you're using the ESV, you might have noticed that verse 47 is missing. What's up with that? Well, the reason for this is because the, the older, considered more reliable ancient Greek manuscripts of the New Testament do not contain verse 47. And from time to time, what will happen is we'll find a very slight variant 
that occurred in the copying process in, in certain ancient manuscripts where a scribe either forgot to copy a letter or a, a word, or maybe they added a minor detail to give context for, for clarification purposes to kind of smooth things out. And so the copying process is so strict that this is, there's always a notation, this is always pointed out. And so what's taken place here is apparently during the copying process, there was a scribe that felt it would be helpful to add, for clarifying purposes, to smooth out the text. This is from, this is verse 47. I took this from the NIV, the New International Version. It says, someone told Jesus, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. And so he just felt that it should also say that there was someone who came and told Jesus. As we can see, this makes zero theological difference and doesn't alter the meaning of the text whatsoever. It's a shame that I have had to spend five minutes on it. However, these textual variants are the kind of things that opponents of Christianity, they actually try to use this to claim, well, the Bible's full of errors. It's actually the exact opposite. So it's important that we do our homework and that we can see for ourselves that that's simply not the case, and that we have an extremely reliable Bible. So now, with all that being said, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? We're going to read Matthew 12, verses 46 through 50. It says, While Jesus was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother? who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we get to spend together studying your word where you speak to us, Lord. The one true God of the universe speaks directly to us. And so, Lord, may we never tire, may we never stop being amazed at that incredible truth. We ask that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts and minds this morning to use this word to bring us closer to you, that we would love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that you would write these truths on our hearts. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. La familia e tutto. The family is everything. Come on, some of you guys know this. Where are my paisans? Growing up in a large Italian-American family, understanding the supreme importance and value of family is ingrained into you from the time you're born. From your first breath, the importance of family is, is impressed upon you. And you know, the same can be said for many other cultures, particularly the Italians' Mediterranean neighbors, the Israelites. That in first century ancient Jewish culture, family was everything. And so when Jesus' mother and brother show up here in verse 46, while he's in the middle of teaching his disciples, the cultural expectation is that Jesus, he should just drop everything that he's doing. That he should put his time with his disciples on the back burner and prioritize whatever it was that his family needed him for. However, we see that Jesus, he doesn't do that. Instead, Jesus does the opposite. That instead of Putting his family first, Jesus goes out of his way in verses 48 through 50 to make it known that he was already with his family, his spiritual family, the family of God. And so this statement would have raised many eyebrows then. And to be honest, for those of us here today, like myself, who were brought up in an extremely family-oriented culture, Jesus' statement here, it kind of turns us inside out a bit. It makes us do some internal somersaults. 
that the thought of not putting your family first, it just doesn't sit right with many of us. I got to tell you, the, the way I was raised, the Italian boy in me is like, Jesus, go out there and talk to your mom. You know, it's like, respect your mom. However, Jesus always makes it a point to prioritize the kingdom and mission of God ahead of family. And we saw this earlier in our study of Matthew, Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 through 39. Jesus says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so this can be a very difficult text for many of us to sift through. Because what Jesus is getting at here is that to be his follower requires a supernatural devotion, commitment, and steadfastness where we are so in love with God and taken by his mission that we must be willing to forego the comforts and allegiances of family if that is what God is calling us to do. Now, please let me make it clear that Jesus is in no way calling us to forsake or turn our backs on our family in order to follow him. That couldn't be any further from the truth, as you will not find a bigger advocate for the family than Jesus, being that he is the one who created the institution of family itself. That we read in 1 Timothy 5.8, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And so the, the family has a prominent role in the life of a Christian. And, and, uh, so, but what we need to look at here, what Jesus is really getting at, is that if we elevate our family above the place of God in our lives, it can greatly hinder our faith and cripple the mission that the Lord has called us to as his people. Now, this is especially true when our family doesn't share our faith, which is the case here in verses 46 through 50, that the text never reveals the reason why Jesus' family wanted to see him. However, what it does clearly say is that Jesus' family, they're located where? They're located outside, while his disciples are located inside. And so the point being made here, what's, what's, what's being depicted here is that Mary and Jesus' brothers haven't been following Jesus in the same way the disciples have, as they have not yet made their home inside the household of faith. In fact, we read in Mark 3.21 that Jesus' family accuses him of being out of his mind. And in John 7, 5, we read, for not even his brothers believed in him. And so what we're seeing here is that, that there's a disconnect between Jesus and his family. However, that disconnect, it's not because Jesus' family doesn't love him, but rather it's because they haven't yet put their faith in him and they're not able to understand his mission, and what he's been called to. And the same is true for many of us who have family members that might be lukewarm or antagonistic towards us about our faith. That it's not that they've stopped loving us, but rather it's the very opposite. That their emotions can be so strong for us that it can lead to them acting out emotionally towards us because they don't understand the transformation and the calling that has been placed on our lives in Christ Jesus, that they're, they're not comfortable with it, and they don't understand it, and, and, and it's just, it, it's, it's wrecking them emotionally. And so if you're in a place where you're struggling with family members who are adversarial about your faith in Jesus, I want to share with you three things that can help us love our families well through this struggle. Number one, be gracious. Give grace to family members who don't yet understand the calling and mission of Jesus. 
Now, the perfect example we have here is Mary, who displayed unparalleled faith in moving forward with the virgin birth and being the mother of Jesus. However, she did not understand the calling on Jesus' life to be the suffering servant. And so when faced with Jesus' mission to go to the cross, she was understandably overwhelmed by her emotions and not wanting to see her son suffer and die. I mean, imagine being in Mary's shoes. Got to cut her some slack, right? Got to show her some grace. So even though it seems cold and harsh for Jesus to say in verse 48, who is my mother? What we need to recognize is that Mary, in her fallen humanity as a loving mother, did not have her mind set on the things of God, but they were set on the things of man. And so, so Jesus isn't disavowing his mother here, but rather he's pointing out this truth that her mind was, was not set on the things of God, but it was set on the things of man. Now the same can be said of our family members who may mean well. And they may love us. The things they say, the things they do, they may mean well. They may think that they're doing them out of love. But in responding emotionally towards us, when we make decisions that they don't understand, that seek first the kingdom of God over family and comfort and self-interest, that, that they don't respond the way that we wish they would. And so what we need to do is we need to show our family members the same grace Jesus showed to us. When we didn't yet have eyes to see the good news of the gospel and the mission of God. And so the second thing we need to do is we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared to expect and receive hostility from our family. That this may be the case after we come to faith in Christ. Not always, but sometimes it is. And so as Christians, we shouldn't be surprised if non-believing family members think we are crazy for surrendering our lives to Jesus. I remember when I was 16 years old, and my parents were so excited to share with me their new faith in Jesus, invite me to come to church with them. And I went, and it was this huge church, and there were these big screens, and they had their hands in the air singing, and everybody's hugging and loving each other, and I'm like, wow, guys, congratulations on joining a cult. These people are trying to steal your money. And, and I absolutely just ream them out for it. And then two years later, I end up giving my life to Jesus and ask them to pay for me to go to Bible college. And so God has a very funny sense of humor. And so sometimes what we need to do is we need to put the shoe on the other foot and think about how we would have responded Right before we had Jesus in our lives, the family members coming to faith in Christ. Because they can't see that if you really lay it out and you think about, like, who's crazy? Is it crazy to invest my life in the temporal things of this world that only last for a short amount of time? Or invest in things of eternity that matter forever, right? When you put it that way and you understand that, it, it's like, no, like, who's really the crazy one here? But they, they don't have eyes yet to see that, okay? And so finally, number three, be patient. That for the majority of us, let's be honest, it took some time to come to saving faith. That there were people that needed to be patient with us, right, in, in our walk and coming to faith in Christ. Now, for Mary, she would be present at the crucifixion and looking to Jesus, not just as her son, but she would look to Jesus also as her Lord and Savior as well. I mean, try and wrap your mind around that. I mean, just truly mind-blowing. In Acts 1.14, we read that Jesus' brothers, they end up coming to saving faith. And in Acts 15, we read of how Jesus' brother James becomes the head of the church in Jerusalem and writes the epistle that bears his name in the New Testament. And Jesus' other brother, Jude, writes uh, the, uh, an epistle that bears his name in the New Testament. And so for our family members, we need to be patient that their stories are not over yet. Right? They haven't been fully written. So we must model the patience and love of Jesus with our unbelieving family members by loving them unconditionally and steadfastly committing them to prayer. 
And so what we must recognize is that Jesus, he did not come to praise the family, but he came to redeem it. And so when we romanticize the family to the point of elevating it above the place of God in our lives, it always ends in disaster. It puts unrealistic expectations on our our spouse, our children, and our extended family that no human beings were meant to bear, that only God could bear such expectations. See, God designed the family to be good, but it has limits, and God knows its limits. And so when we put God first in our family, it leads to healthy, while still imperfect marriages, children who have the knowledge, grace, and love of God to help guide them in making their way through this fallen world, and it leads to our families becoming closer with one another as we draw closer to Christ. And so in a roundabout way, when we put God first in our lives, in a roundabout way, it is putting our family first in our lives, because the best thing we could do for the health of our family, is to put God first in our lives. And so this brings us to the second point in our outline this morning, family and mission, where we're going to look at some tangible ways we can live out the mission of God together in our families. And so if Jesus came to redeem families, then we need to ask the question, well, what does a redeemed family look like? Well, in 1 Corinthians 10.31, it says, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And as a family, we do everything together. We live life together. And so I want to use this verse as a template for the family on mission, where God calls us to bring, he calls us out to bring him glory in everything that we do in every aspect and in every area of our lives, whether it be with our time, our talent, and our treasure. That's the terminology we like to use a lot here, how we break this down, how in everything in our lives, we look to glorify God in our time, our talent, and in our treasure. So let's let's take a moment to, to take some time and look at this together. What does this look like? So first, how can we as families serve God with our time? How can we surrender our time to the Lord? Because it's so easy. I don't know about your family, but it's so easy for us. The end of a long school day, the end of a long work day, that we end up retreating to the separate corners of our house where, you know, dad's watching sports, mom's reading her book, the kids are on their screens in their bedrooms. And and, and this can be just a really unhealthy and destructive rhythm in the life of the family. And if your family is like my family, right, we, we have screen time limits on our kids, but during the pandemic, that went out the window. And so it was su- it's been super hard to kind of take that, put the genie back in the bottle. A- a- and so what are some things that we can do as a family to resist these kinds of destructive rhythms in our households? Well, first, one of the things we can do, and it's so simple, is prioritize making mealtimes, whether it's breakfast or dinner, whatever works best for your family. For us, it's breakfast, as making it a time for family devotions that you got to eat, right? Something that you have to do. And so use these times as a time to slow down and to come together as a family to open up the Word of God. And this is a real passion area of Pastor Nick. So go talk to Pastor Nick. He has a a lot of resources that he would love to help resource you with and point you in the right direction to get that started in your home. He has a lot of resources, and he's got a lot of recipes too. So he can help you in, in either way. All right? Next is start your morning and end your day by praying together as a family. It doesn't have to be super long, but what this does is it puts us in the right frame of mind, that together as a family, that, that we, to being aware that we are in the presence of God, that throughout our day that we know that God is with us, and we have that mindset that God is with us. And it's just a really great habit to, to get into as a family, to start your day in prayer and to end your day in prayer together. Next, if you have young children, make prayer and Bible reading part of their bedtime routine, that this is such a blessing that you develop a bedtime routine, have the kids, they wind down, and part of it is you tuck them in 
And, and, and if you don't have a good children's Bible, whether it be for your kids, your grandkids, your niece or nephew, I cannot, I cannot recommend this enough. The Jesus Storybook Bible by Sally Lloyd-Jones, it might be the best theological work of the last 10, 20 years. I mean, it is so incredibly powerful, so well written. Um, I, I, so many times when my kids were young and I would be reading to them out of the Jesus Storybook Bible, I was like, I was captivated by it. I mean, the tears are just rolling down my, my face. And so it just makes such an impact to be able to do this with, with your children. Um, next, commit one night of, of your week to attend life group, youth group, or fit kids together. Be in biblical community together with the people of God. Sun, just Sunday morning is not enough. And so whether life group works best for you, or if you have teenagers, and, you, and it's a great opportunity to serve as a youth leader, you can talk to Pastor Nick about that, that you go together to youth group as a, as a family, or maybe it's fit kids, you serve there together as a family, you can talk to our children's ministry director, Jamie Reuter, about it. Just a really great thing to be in biblical community together as a family. And lastly, do something regularly as a family that's fun and edifying. Like, what is it that your family's passionate about? What is it that you like to do together that's fun? So for us, one of the things that we love to do is we love movies. And so we, love, we have movie nights where afterwards we'll talk about the biblical themes present in the movie. And we don't even always do it in a formal sense. Sometimes it'll take the next day at the breakfast table that we'll be like, hey, do you know when like, this happened in the movie? It reminded me of this from the scriptures. And the best is when it's not an overtly Christian movie. And of course, the movie needs to be age appropriate and all that. But I remember when um, we, Nicholas, for his birthday uh, on, um, it, it, it was around Thanksgiving, we, we, were all sick with, we, we were all sick with the flu and we couldn't go out. He's like, for my birthday, I want to watch the new Top Gun movie. And so it was really good. So we watched the Top Gun movie, and, and there's the, the one scene where, you know, Maverick's willing to lay down his life for Rooster, and, and it's like, we, it was like, this is, it points towards the gospel, laying down our lives for our friends, because no matter how hard Hollywood tries, what's stitched together, right, in our hearts, it's part of us, is the story of redemption. And we see it all, everywhere we go, right? No matter where it is, what, what we're looking at, what we watch, even in Hollywood secular movies, right? Same thing, we're watching the Avengers, and it was like, why didn't Hawkeye's lust for revenge in the Avengers bring him any peace? It's an opportunity to talk about the scriptures. And what it does is it blesses your kids with the gift of a Christian worldview, and it's a lot of fun while you're doing it, that, that everything you do, everything you look at, it's through the lens of the scriptures. And so I know this sounds really corny, but the family that prays and plays together, it stays together. It's true. It's true. Very corny, but true. So next, how can we as families serve God on mission with our talent? And so what has God gifted your family in and given them a passion for, right? We all have different gifts. We all have different passions, right, as, as a family. And, and so let's just say it, maybe your passion as a family is sports. Have you ever thought about getting involved in sports ministry? Have you ever thought about getting involved with one of our missions partners, like FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, that Harry Flaherty is, is a part of our congregation, and he would love to be able to talk with you. How can you get more involved, your family get more involved in Fellowship of Christian Athletes? Maybe you help your kids start a, a Bible study or, or a Christian service project at their school or on their, their sports teams. There's so many different avenues for sports ministry. If your family has the gift of mercy, have you thought about making your family vacation this year a short-term missions trip? Our missions chair, Corinne Brennan, would love to give you suggestions and point you in the right direction. If your family's been blessed with a heart for children, talk to Jamie Reuter about serving in kids' ministry together as a family or clubhouse or VBS this summer, okay? If your family's been blessed with the gift of hospitality, make it an, a, a regular practice to open up your home to foster biblical community. This is something that, that my family loves to do, Pastor Nick, their family love to do, but guess what? There's a lot of you guys, and we wish we could have all of you over, especially when we see somebody that's new, but we need your help. 
And so if this is a passion area for you, when you come on Sunday morning, you're on mission. And look, th- there's somebody that I feel like needs some encouragement or somebody I've never seen before. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to strike up a conversation with them, and I'm going to look to invite them over to my house for, for lunch or dinner or something. Right? Maybe, maybe there's somebody that, that needs a place to stay. And you can practice hospitality by taking them into your home. This is something our family's done, which was an incredible blessing for us and that my kids were, were able to be a, a part of. Or lastly, this is a really good one. And everybody knows that this is the truth. When you were growing up, in your friend group, there was always the house, right, that everybody hung out with, hung out at. And so make your house the house for your kids and their friends so that they can experience the love and warmth of a Christian home because we don't know what some of our kids' friends Maybe we don't know what they have going on at home, what their home lives are like, right? The, the things that they may be experiencing or they have a void in their, their home. And, and it may be that when they're at your house, it's the only time they're able to see, right, a, 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 the, the love of Christ in the, in the middle of a marriage or, or how you parent your children, okay, or, or how they're, they're treated, the kindness that you show them. And, and, and so lastly, number three, how can we as family serve God on mission with our treasure? And the greatest treasure we have as the people of God is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel where the Lord has adopted us into his family, the church where we have received the incalculable inheritance of his spiritual blessings in Christ. And one of the things that is just so beautiful about belonging to the family of God is its amazing diversity. That, that the church has been created by God to exist as the most diverse group of people on the planet, where it doesn't matter what your, your age or your gender or your race or your ethnicity or your interest, your passions, whatever they are, that we all come together because of the good news of the gospel, because of the Holy Spirit that's inside of us as the people of God, and now we all belong to the same family. And so in saying that, We need to make ourselves aware as the people of God that many times when we do talk about family, that we can unknowingly do so in a way that pushes those who are single or without children to the periphery. And so whether someone chooses singleness for the sake of Christian service or in their faithful fight against same-sex attraction or their singleness is the result of being widowed, divorced, or never married, it is imperative that when we say family, that in the church, that no one is left behind and everyone is, is welcomed around the banquet table that is the family of God. And so we need to go out of our way to make sure that, that no one is ever left behind and everyone feels included. And so this leads us to the third and final point in our outline this morning, family and faith, where we see that Jesus' desire and vision is for the natural family to be redeemed and then strengthened by the family of God. So let's read Matthew 12, verses 49 through 50. It says, And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, Jesus said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And so, even though God created the institution of the family to be a blessing to us, the book of Genesis very, very early on warns of the devastating effects the curse of sin has had upon families, right? That that, that is exactly where the curse of sin hits hardest uh, the, the most, right, when, when we think about it, right, whether it's husband and wives struggling for dominance over one another that we see in Genesis 3.16 after Adam and Eve's sin, right, and during the painful challenges that are a part of giving birth and raising children that are the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin, we're experiencing sibling rivalries that can completely tear families apart that we see in the account of Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4. And so it's very, very clear Right? Not just from the scriptures, but we can see it as plain as day in our culture and our society that the family is in need 
of help. And this is why God the Father sent his son Jesus to redeem the family. That in verses 49 through 50, Jesus declares that those who belong to the family of God are those who hear, receive, and do God's will. And he's referring to those who belong to the more common name for the family of God, which is the church. You see, that, that so many of us, we make the common mistake of identifying the church as being a religious building, institution, organization, or denomination that we're consumers at, that we attend. However, this couldn't be any further from, this, from the truth that we see in the scriptures, where the word for church in the New Testament, in the Greek word is ekklesia, which literally means called out once. And, and I want to take a moment, and I know that I'm probably preaching to the choir here because the people who need to hear this aren't here. But we make the mistake, and, and it's part of our consumer mindset, right, in, in the West, specifically in, in our country, that we come to church as consumers, that we attend our church. And that's not what we see in the scriptures at all. We are called out as the family of God, that we belong to the church. The church is not a building, an institution, or organization. It is a family. And so let me ask you, if one of your family members just disappeared and stopped coming home, what would that do to you? How would that impact you? Think about what it's like for us, right? It's painful when there are people that are a part of our church family and they just stop coming and they disappear. And, and, and it, it, you have no idea how hurtful that is and how it, 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 it affects the entire body of Christ or those that approach church as an organization that they, they what, what, does, what can church do for me? That imagine if everybody in your, in your family, right, that, that nobody pulled their own weight, that nobody contributed in, in their family, that every had the mindset of, of just wanting to take instead of giving. There's no love in that. Think about what a dysfunctional family that would be. And so when it comes to the church, we're a family, that we have responsibilities to give the very best of our time, talent, and treasure to the Lord. And so the question is, are we doing that? What does our family look like, the family of God? Is it a dysfunctional family or is it a healthy family? See, the Lord Jesus has called out and set aside for himself a people in whom through receiving him as their Lord and Savior by grace, through faith in him alone, that we can become one with him. We become one with Christ. That the Spirit of God actually lives inside of us. That this is the common bond we share as the people of God that makes us one, that makes us part of the same family. That we all get to play a part in this family, to partner together with Christ in his redemptive work of restoring, restoring the entire world from the curse of sin and death. How incredible is that? How incredible is what we read in Ephesians 1, 5, and 6 where it says, In love, God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. That Jesus, in his, in his mind-blowing love for us, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that they're in their mind-blowing love for us, and in infinite kindness towards us, our Heavenly Father, he calls us out of sin and darkness and death, he calls us out and he invites us to become a permanent part of his family, right? That we were, we were dirty and wretched and lost and without a home. And God makes us clean and he takes us in and he bestows upon us all the riches, the inheritance that comes with being a child of God. He makes us a permanent part of his family through his son, Jesus Christ. That where it says in Ephesians 1.5 that God has predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, 
we need to recognize that that word adoption here, it is a legal term pertaining to the procedure that secures a child's identity in a new family. And so what this means for us, spiritually speaking, is absolutely life-changing and transformational that now we belong to God and he belongs to us forever. That God is now our father and we have become his child and we have been given a new identity, a new family. That we are now a child of the most high God. And this is the good news that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that our adoption papers have been sealed by the redemptive blood of our Savior, which cleanses us from sin, enables us to become heirs with Christ, obtaining an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will never fade away, and is reserved in heaven for us, as it says in 1 Peter 1.4. By the grace of God, through no work of our own, it's a gift that can only be received by the grace of God, we are able to share in the same status and inheritance as the Lord Jesus Christ, as a child of the Father. It's absolutely astounding. That is scandalous, what it means to be a part of the family of God. And so in the same way Jesus asks in verse 48, who is my mother and who are my brothers? we must essentially ask ourselves the same question, which is, what is my spiritual identity? Have I made God my father? Can I call Jesus my brother? Am I guiding and shepherding my spouse, my children, my extended family in the redeeming love of Jesus Christ that leads to new and everlasting life? Have I committed to the family of God? And so God invites you to take that step today in becoming a part of his permanent family, the family of God, by surrendering your life to him by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. I'd like to ask the worship team to come up. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of family how you have designed the institution of family to be such a blessing to us. Lord, we see in your word that you redeem the entire world through a family. And Lord, you invite us to become part of your family where we can be renewed and restored, that we can call on you as our Father, that we can refer to the Lord Jesus as our brother, and receive your imperishable inheritance, Lord. And so I pray this morning for families that may be hurting, that by your grace and mercy, that you would restore and redeem these families, Lord. And I pray for anyone here this morning who has not yet called upon you to be their father, who has not yet taken that step to join your family, that they would do so this morning by grace through faith in your son Jesus. So I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing.